theoretically we have to turn to Surah An-Nur. There is a Surah of the Quran entitled Surah An-Nur. So this is the first Surah to which we should turn. And in Surah An-Nur, ayah number 35, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us that pivotally important ayah of the Quran in which he says, Allahu nuru samawati wal ab ila akhil al ayah. That Allah is the nur of the samawat and do not translate samawat as heavens. Heaven is Jannah. Samawat is not heaven. Samawat is the different worlds of space and time. The seven different worlds of space and time that Allah has created alongside this material universe. Allah is the nur of the samawat and of the earth. And Allah is the nur of all creation. Hence everything created has come from nur. Everything created has its origin in nur. This is deducible from the sub statement Allahu Nuru Samawati Wal Ab. When Allah began creation, He first created the angels. And the angels are created from Nur. And then Perhaps, since light, nur, has within it heat, it is possible that part of the world of nur was transformed into fire. Not the fire with which we cook, but a smokeless fire. And from this fire, he created the jinn. And then, perhaps, part of the world of fire cooled down to become clay, teen, teen. And with this Allah created the human being. If this theory is correct, then the human being is originally light and he traversed from light through fire to clay. And uh, the return trip is back to light. In the process of creating these three categories of beings, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created the material universe and also the seven worlds of space and time. But then he said to the angels that I'm going to place the human being as my Khalifa here in the material universe. The angels can be here, the jinn can be here, but we can't see them. And they, not, they cannot function in the historical process because they don't have a body that can operate in this world. If an angel assumes a human form, then the angel can walk amongst us 
and we would think it's a human being but actually it's still an angel if a jinn assumes a human form then the jinn can walk amongst us we would not know it's a jinn but if you were to offer the angel who has come as a human being offer the angel some food some nasi goreng can the angel eat it? no <laughs> the angel is appearing as a human being but the angel cannot eat food can you offer some food to the jinn? the jinn cannot eat it no so although they are appearing in human form they are still jinn and angels now then when Allah created the angels he gave to the angels something called self-consciousness the capacity to say I hmm? I am Jibra'il and you are the messenger of Allah hmm? the angel said so angels have self-consciousness but angels cannot make choice they don't have a self-directed will they therefore cannot commit sin rather angels must do whatever they are ordered to do nor do angels have the capacity to think creatively no to think independently no la ilma lana illa ma allamtana we have no knowledge other than that which you give to us so this is the status of the angels in this road towards Islamic spirituality they have the least amount of what we call personality but what about the jinn? does a jinn have a name? oh yes Iblis has a name can a jinn say I? yes Iblis says Ana khayru minhu I am better than him you created me from fire and you created him from clay so the jinn possess self-consciousness can does a jinn possess a self-directed will can a jinn choose yes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks Iblis Iblis when I ordered you to bow down to prostrate why did you not he said well I am better than him why should I <laughs> meaning he had the capacity to choose he had a self-directed will so he is in a superior status of personality than angels does the jinn possess independent knowledge? Can he think independently? Yes! This is the master logician arguing with Allah. You created me from fire. You created him from clay. And they taught me at university that fire is superior to clay. It followed logically therefrom, I am superior to him. Pulls up. This is the logician. Hmm? and so the jinn do possess a creative intellect but they have limitations the jinn the famous example of the limited intellectual capacity the limited rational faculty of a jinn is the story in the Quran of the death of whom of Yes, you said it. 
Sulaiman alayhi salam Sulaiman alayhi salam died while sitting on the chair with his staff and he's dead and the jinn are walking under his command and they did not know he was dead and they kept on walking and walking and walking and walking and walking until the batul art termite here began eating of the stick and when the equilibrium was lost then the body toppled over <laughs> if the termite had not done that the jinn would have kept on working not knowing that he was dead but when we come to the human being remember Islamic spirituality or basira reaches its highest status now you must know who you are and you must know what you are capable of not only does a human being possess self-consciousness the capacity to say I this is mine hmm? but also the human being possesses a self-directed will for alhamaha fujuraha wa taqwaha each human being has been inspired with the capacity to either pursue the path of virtue or the path of sin and evil and you have a limited capacity to choose to the extent that you have freedom to choose you are accountable for your choice hmm? finally not only does a human being possess self-consciousness and a self-directed will but he possesses the creative intellect a capacity to pursue knowledge independently a capacity to extend the frontiers of knowledge that's what you have are you using it <laughs> and when Allah when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks in the Quran of Noor in that famous ayah 35 of Surah An-Nur he ends this ayah with the statement wallahu bi kulli shay'in ha alim meaning that the primary function of nur is for knowledge and so islamic spirituality is meant to function primarily in the pursuit of knowledge and it is not only external knowledge but also internal knowledge and the integration of these two Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was on the battlefield of uh, Uhud with the Muslim army and there was one companion of his who got married the night before so he was given permission to spend the night with his wife he spent the night with his wife he consummated the marriage and in the morning he got up he made his ghusl because he was in the state of janaba and uh, then he performed his salat and now he's saying goodbye to her so he can head for the battlefield when she held on to him and he had to have relations with her one more time and then in the state of Janaba without having made ghusl he ran to the battlefield and he jumped into the battlefield and fought and was killed Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam was then seen looking up in the sky and saying subhanallah 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 so the companions who were around him looked up they saw nothing 
After the battle was over, they asked, O Messenger of Allah, what was that? Subhanallah, Subhanallah, Subhanallah. He said, your best, your companion who got married night before and who uh, was left with his wife and then this morning he came and he joined us and he was killed in the battle. I saw his body up there in the sky and I saw the angels giving the body ghusl. Oh! But there was another body on the ground. This one was made of clay. So what was that one made of? <laughs> that one had to have the same shape, same features as this one. So you could recognize who he is. This is the physical body. That's the spiritual body. In pursuing spirituality, we have to recognize that the human being is comprised of a physical body. The Quran refers to the physical body of Fir'aun in Surah to Yunus. This day, Fir'aun, we are going to preserve your badan, your physical body. So the human being has a physical body, which if it is not preserved, would, uh, what? The, the worms will eat it up. But in addition to the physical body, the human being possesses a nafs. Wa nafsim wa ma sawwaha. Allah created the nafs and Allah fashioned the nafs. Huh? The nafs is you. You are not your body so much. Because if you lose half of your body, people don't say you have Imran now. Do they say that? If you lose your legs and you only have the top portion of your body, this is half of Imran. No, you're still Imran, <laughs> even if you lost, lost half of your physical body. Because Imran is not the physical body. The physical body is being used or inhabited by Imran. But the physical body is not Imran. So then, who or what is Imran? It is the nafs. It is the nafs which will stand before Allah on judgment day to be tried. And we pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may cover our sins and forgive us our sins and have mercy on our souls, you and I, on that day. Amin. But there's something else. There's something else in addition to the physical body and in addition to the nafs, there is the ruh. And we'll turn to the ruh, inshallah, after the azan. The physical body has a physical heart. And when this goes bad, then you go to the heart specialist called the cardiologist. Hmm? But when Allah says in the Quran, Fi bihim marad, that in their hearts there is a disease. Is he talking about the physical heart that you can go to the pharmacy and buy some tablets, some medicine to cure the disease of the heart? No. No, he's not talking about the physical heart, not at all. Well then, which heart is he talking about? Fi kulubihim marat. In their hearts there is a disease. That spiritual body up there in the sky, which was being given the ghusl, 
also has a heart, <laughs> a spiritual heart. So in addition to the physical heart, we also have the spiritual heart. We have a physical heart and we have a spiritual heart. It is with the spiritual heart that we see. But no, where is the evidence? Allah says in the Quran, Afalam yasiru fil ar. Will they not travel to the earth? Perchance that by traveling to the earth, the dead heart might come alive. Not the one that the cardiologist is treating. No, no, the other one. فَتَكُونَ لَهُمْ كُلُومُ يَعْكِلُونَ بِهَا And when the dead heart comes alive, they then they are able to use that heart. We wish to be able to pursue knowledge. أَوْذَيْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا and when the dead heart comes alive, then they'll be, able, they'll be able to hear what otherwise they were not hearing. For innaha la ta'amal absar. No, it's not these eyes which are blind. Walakin ta'amal kulub. Walakin ta'amal kulub allati fi sudur. What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest, not the head. <laughs> the chest, not the head. And so the spiritual heart in the chest of the spiritual body, that is where you see with the nur of Allah. We now have to turn to this fascinating part of the subject called the Ruh. I think it was Molana Jalaluddin Rumi in his Masnavi who gave the analogy of the relationship between the nafs and the ruh to that of a rider and a horse. <laughs> that the nafs is the traveler who travels and the ruh is the vehicle with which he travels. Hmm? The nafs has to be prepared for the journey before it can travel. You need to get your passport, you need to get a visa, you need to buy the ticket from the travel agency, all of these things, before you can travel. So the nafs has to go on a journey to prepare for travel. And uh, if you go to my teacher, Maulana uh, Dr. Muhammad Fadlur Rahman Ansari Rahimahullah, in his masterpiece, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, we have the book outside in two volumes. You see he has a chapter in volume one entitled Tazkiyah, the process of preparing for the journey or the process of purification of the nafs. The Quran speaks about a nafsul ammara the self which is prone to evil and then that nafsul ammara is purified and as it is purified it begins to reflect upon all the sins it has committed in life and it reproaches itself and now it has become nafsul lawama and after it surmounts that process of reproaching itself it reaches a state of satisfaction, nafsul mutmainna, pleased with itself, and Allah is pleased with it. Now, you're ready 
to travel. The Quran gives in that same ayah, Ayatul Nur of Surah Al Nur, it also gives us the methodology of preparation for the travel. It says that Allah is the Nur of the heavens and of the earth. And the example of his nur is a hollow space or a niche. And Nabi Muhammad والسلام, said located in the heart, in the chest. And in that hollow space there is a lamp, a misbah. And that lamp has a glass around it, zujaja. And that glass has to be cleaned remove all the stains on the glass and then the glass has to be polished the removal of the stains is the tezkiyah and there's a chapter on tezkiyah in that book I mentioned my teacher's book which is outside and then you have to polish the glass and that is the zikr the process of zikr zikr Allah to polish the glass but that's not all in addition to cleaning and polishing the glass, this verse of the Quran tells us you need oil for the lamp. And you're not going to get oil for the lamp going to work in the morning, facing the morning traffic, coming back home in the evening, facing the evening traffic, then you're having your dinner, and then you sit down and watch television until it's time to sleep. And then the next day you do the same thing, and the next day you do the same thing. And then when the weekend time comes, well, that's the time to go shopping and go sightseeing and so on. And that's how you spend your life. No. You're not going to get any oil that way. No. In order to get oil, you have to do more than be in Ibadah, for example, day and night in Ibadah. That one is going to work in the morning, coming home in the evening. But this one is constantly in Ibadah. Morning and night he's in Ibadah. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Jibra'il islam to destroy that town. So Jibra'il islam said, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but in that town is this servant of yours, who is constantly in Ibadah. But in that town there are sharks and the sharks are gobbling up the sardines and this man does nothing. He doesn't even raise his little finger to stand up to the oppressor and to liberate the oppressed because if I do that they will put my name on a no-fly list. If I do that, I won't have freedom to travel. I won't get a visa, a US visa. If I do that, my business will collapse. If I do that, I won't get promotion in my job. If I do that, people will say, I'm a terrorist. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? So he does nothing. Day and night, ibadah. So Jibra'il alayhi salam asks, Shall we? What about him? To which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied and says, Destroy him and destroy the town. Destroy him and destroy the town. You need oil. And you cannot get oil unless you work for it. In your heart there must be a restlessness. That when I see that which is munkar, I want to change it with my hand. And if I can't change it with my hand, I want to change it with my tongue. And if I can't change it with my tongue, I want to change it with my heart. And then pack up and get out of the city and head for the remote countryside. 
So when the ship sinks, I won't sink with that ship. Hugo Chavez set the example for us of a man who stood up against the sharks and worked to liberate the Shadins. He didn't seek to bridge, bring the sharks and the Shadins together in one Jamaat. <laughs> no. So in order, in order for you to be able to reach that state where the nafs can now receive nur, you need oil. What have you done for Islam? That the truth might triumph in the world. That the truth might triumph over all rivals. What have you done? If you are a young man and you're listening to me today in any part of the world, I know your heart is beating and vibrating. You want to do something. But those who have grown old and the dunya has embraced them, that's a different story. And so now that you are eligible for Noor, the growth of the soul has taken, of the self, not the, not the soul, the self has taken place from Amara to Lawama to Mutmainna. We now have cleaned the glass. We have polished it through the remembrance of Allah. We are producing oil by standing up against that which is wrong and standing up for that which is right, regardless of the price that we have to pay. Now we are eligible for Noor. But Allah says, Yahdillahu li nurihi man yasha. Allah guides to his nur whomsoever Allah chooses to guide. So although you may be eligible for nur, it is when Allah gives it to you. And Allah may not give it to everyone. How will we know that we have nur? This part of the lecture is frightening, is terrifying. When we are raised for judgment, there are three critical moments that we will face. The first is when we are put on a scale to be weighed. In this world we may weigh heavy. When our car pulls up, people are there to open the door for us. <laughs> but on that day when we are put on the scale, we may not weigh as much as a house fly. Hmm? And then comes the second critical moment. kitab, When our book is granted to us. And when the sinful person looks at that book, he says, Ma li al-kitab. What kind of a book is this? La yugadiru sagiratan wa la kabiratan illa ahsaha. Nothing is left out in this book. Everything is there, big and small. If the book is handed to us in our right hand, alhamdulillah. But if the book is handed in our left hand or behind our back, that's bad news. But it's the third one that is very terrifying. The third critical moment will know, you will know whether we have Noor or not. <laughs> the third critical moment is when there is a bridge to cross. Great is the wisdom of Allah. Great is the wisdom of Allah. There is heaven, Jannah. It's just there across the bridge. And underneath the bridge is Jahannam. And it's a narrow bridge. And the place is dark for those who have no light. How dark? The Quran says that when they put their hand in front of their face, they can't see their hand. 
That's how dark it is. If you do not have Noor, you cannot cross that bridge. And so there'll be those who'll be crossing the bridge. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam, some have only enough Noor to see one step ahead. And others have so much Noor they could see from Medina all the way to Yemen. <laughs> As these are crossing the bridge, the ones who have no Noor are calling out to these. Can you allow us to walk with you? But then the angels intervene and said, no, go look for your own light. So this is how we will know whether or not we have Noor. On that day when we have to cross the bridge. Once you become eligible for Noor, then Allah says, Noorun ala Noor. Every act of worship that you perform and it is accepted by Allah would now be transformed into Noor. For example, the Prophet said, A Salat Noor. Salat is Noor. So if Allah accepts our Salat, then that Salat is transformed into Noor. But we have a problem. He said, As Salatu Miftahul Jannah. That Salat is the key to Jannah. But he didn't stop there. He said, Al Wudu Miftahu Salat. Wudu is the key to Salat. And we don't perform wudu anymore. No? You don't believe me? Go to the place where wudu is being performed after listening to the lecture. And if you have tears to weep, weep. And you see how they perform wudu today. A man was performing wudu. And the Prophet wasalam, saw him and ask him for an explanation for this israf waste of water so the man was surprised O messenger of Allah is there such a thing as israf in wudu yes said the messenger of Allah even if you have a running stream of water before you in Jandabai Still, you must not exceed the limit. What is the limit? How much water should we use for wudu? This is when it's advantageous to have this hat. <laughs> A mud of water can be take, contained in this hat and you still have some left over. Hmm? That's how much water you need for wudu. The Prophet ﷺ would take a container and pour on his, with his left hand, pour on his right hand. That's the first act of wudu. This is the sunnah. Where is the sunnah today? Huh? The first act of wudu is to pour the water on the right hand. The next act of wudu is to take the right hand and dip with it. And this much water, which is in your hand, called a ghurfa, this is the amount of water to be used in every act of wudu. And when you are finished with your wudu, if there was any water left in the container, he, the Prophet ﷺ, would drink it. Oh, we who would be around, we would be rushing to get that water to drink it. 
Shall I introduce you to the wudu of Gog and Magog? Huh? Ya'juj and Ma'juj? One of the trademarks of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is the waste of water. They will pass by a river and drink it dry. And when the world is being attacked by Gog and Magog, you see water diminishing all over the world. The lakes, the rivers running dry, the lakes going low, ships having to use new parts to navigate the Great Lakes in Canada. Hmm? Gog and Magog, they waste water, overconsumption of water. The new way of performing wudu is that you open the tap and uh, because you're a good Muslim you open it on, open it, full blast, <laughs> full blast and uh, no longer are you bothered about this much water, no, that's gone. And when you are washing your mouth, the water is still flowing. And you're washing your nose, the water is still flowing. And you're washing your hands, the water is still flowing. And you're passing your hands over your head, the water is still flowing. And when you collect all of that water, if you collect it, you probably can fill this 50, 60, 100 times. Does that qualify as a valid wudu? If the companions of the Prophet وسلم, were alive today and they go to the place where wudu is being performed, they'll take sticks and run us out of town. They say, these are not Muslims. These are the children of Gog and Magog. These are not Muslims. That's what they'll do to us. And this is the key to Salat. So if your wudu is the wudu of Gog and Magog, how can your Salat get you nur? And the same thing is applicable to the amount of water you use for ghusl. Hmm? But that's not the only problem that we face. If we want to get nur and Salat, it's a vehicle. The next problem we face is Oh, but, mashallah, we have such lovely masajid today. Grand structures, mashallah. I wonder if these were built with paper money. Bogus, fraudulent, and utterly haram paper money. Hmm? If they were built with paper money, Dajjal's money, how can you call it a masjid? How can you call it a masjid? If we want to perform salat and we want to get a, have a chance that our salat would be accepted, well, you better look for some bamboo and some wood and pay the laborer in dirhams you have no excuse because dirhams in the market now. In fact, we, I think we have a table outside with dirhams. Huh? Dirhams in the market now. So if you're using dirhams to pay for the labor and pay for the material to build the musalla, in Malaysia you call it surau, or the masjid, then you know this is the house of Allah. And if I perform my salat in this building, I have a chance that my salat will be accepted and be transformed into nur. Now let us turn to the next two, which are the major sources of nur. And with this we'll end. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the books which he has sent down that they all possess nur and that the Quran also possesses nur because this is kalamullah 
And so a major road to Noor for us in this Ummah is the Quran. Even when you re recite the Quran without understanding the Quran, even then there is Barakah for you. But if you remain like that all your life, Imam is reciting the Quran. مَثَلُ الَّذِينَ حُمِّلُوا التَّوْرَاتَ ثُمَّ لَمْ يَحْمِلُوهَا كَمَثَلِ الْأَصْفَارِ كَمَثَلِ الْحِمَارِ يَحْمِلُوا الْأَصْفَارِ And when the Salat is over, someone asks, What did he say? And you reply and said, MashaAllah, it was a lovely tune. He recited beautifully, but I didn't understand what he said. Huh? And if you continue to remain like that, you are disrespecting the Quran. And therefore disrespecting Allah. So it's time to wake up. You have enough time to study nuclear physics? Huh? In MIT? And get a PhD? But you don't have enough time to study enough Arabic to be able to read and understand at least the surface meaning of the Quran. And when the Imam is reciting the Quran, you don't know what he is saying. How then can the Quran be a vehicle for Noor? The method in which you show respect for the Quran is to constantly recite it, cover to cover cover to cover and when I was in Trinidad I was doing it once a month alhamdulillah but now because of this internet and a hundred emails every day please don't send any more questions to me because you're denying me the time I need to recite the Quran hmm? you must recite the Quran cover to cover. When you finish, you start again. When you finish, you start again. And you must start with your children when they are young. When it becomes a habit for them, every day they recite the Quran, then all through their life the Quran will be there for them. And the Quran will become a vehicle for Noor. But it is not enough to recite the Quran. If you had studied the Quran, you would know what is money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because we didn't study the Quran and the teacher who taught the Quran, we all accepted this bogus paper money. And one last avenue for Noor. And that is, Allah says, قَدْ جَاءَكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ نُورٌ وَكِتَابٌ مُبِينٌ there's come from Allah not only this book but Noor, Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. He is also the vehicle through which we can acquire Noor. Not only for those who lived in his time, wa akharina minhum, lamma yalhaku bihim, wa huwa al hakim. But Nabi Muhammad also. Sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam has an abiding mission to perform. Even for those who did not live in his time but live in a later time. Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam still has a function to perform. Through whom we can get nur. For example, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima In by sending salat and salam on Nabi Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam You are already beginning the process of getting him to function as wasila Through whom you can get nur But it makes no sense to be reciting salat and salam on Monday morning you're there at the bank applying for a loan on interest <laughs> to buy a car or to perform the Hajj? No. You have to be faithful to the Messenger of Allah. You have to follow him 
In kuntum tuhibbun Allah fattabi'uni yuhibbukum Allah. You have to follow him. Follow his sunnah. And if you do that and you love him more than you love your parents, more than you love your children, more than you love all of mankind. And nabiyyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet alayhi salatu waslam is dearer to the believer than their own selves, their parents, their children. So when the time comes for hijrah, because I am following the sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. I hope you're listening to me in France. I hope you're listening to me in Belgium, in Britain, in Canada, in the United States. When the time comes for hijrah, to follow the sunnah of hijrah, to leave a place where you do not have the freedom to live as a Muslim, you do not have the freedom to stand up against munkar. You cannot say, as I can say here in Malaysia, there are three kinds of lies. There are normal lies and then there are great lies and then there is 9-11, the Zionist 9-11 lie. You can't say that in the United States. They send you to Guantanamo. So you have to make hijra. Go to some part of Allah's earth where you'll have the freedom to live as a Muslim. Your wife can be in hijab. You are following the sunnah. But your parents say, no, we're not going. Or your wife and your children say, you can go, we're, gonna, we're not going. This is heaven. What do you do? What do you do? My lecture ends with this. The, the, the Prophet comes first before everybody else. And Nabiyu awla bil mu'minina min anfusihim. So you follow the sunnah of Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam and you make hijrah. Whether they go with you or they don't go with you, you go. You make your hijrah. If you do that, then you are showing love for Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam. Then he can function as a medium through which you can get new. There are other parts of the lecture which I don't have the time to address to you 